bus stop is not out of your way? Sure, Bill, I'll be there. Don't forget my party tomorrow night, because we're bringing all your friends. Oh, I'll party with Tommy tonight. Bye, everyone. I'll give you a ring first thing in the morning. Better make it about 11 if you can. Can I have a I ought to be going, too. It was awfully nice of you to invite me here. You know, this is the first time I've been to anything like this. And thanks a lot, Bruce, for showing me how rock and roll is jazz. Bruce? Did you tell her that rock and roll is jazz? Yeah, sure, that's what I told her. Is there something wrong with that? Bruce, how square can you get? Rock and roll is not jazz. Rock and roll is merely an offspring of rhythm and blues. Now look here, whatever your name is, who are you to know so much for Natalie, putting in like this? Natalie, you haven't met Alex. Alex here is an arranger for the Paul Stevenson group. So what? Oh, that makes him an authority. <laughs> Almost anyone knows rock and roll is not jazz, huh, Alex? Well, if jazz is not rock and roll, what is jazz? But tell me what jazz is, Alex. Jazz, jazz is merely the Negro's cry of joy and suffering. Oh, now, wait a minute, Lewis. You talk as if Negroes were the only ones who could have created jazz. Not only did they create jazz, they were the only ones who could have created jazz. Now look, that's unfair, Alex. There are a lot of fine white musicians that play jazz. Remember, you and I heard some last night. Sure there are, but the Negro and the Negro alone created jazz. He created jazz from the special slant he has on the American scene. That's how he tells his story. Only a part of it. Well, it's, it's clear to me that the Negro created jazz, but... Still, is he the only one who could have created it? Yes, the Negro was the only one with the necessary musical and human history to create jazz. No, if you mean the Negro suffered, everybody suffered. And who suffered more than the Jews? Yeah, how can you answer that one? Well, a Negro can be Jewish or Catholic. Now, you can lose a leg, I can lose a leg. Whatever happens to you can happen to me. And in addition, I'm Negro. All right, all right. But what I want to know about is, what about all the fine white musicians that have contributed to jazz? Jazz is American. You guys are trying to make a racial distinction where there isn't one. Look, John, all the fundamental and basic contributions to all the various kinds of jazz have been made by Negroes. The white musicians you speak of are merely playing follow the leader. Well, Alex, what is there about the Negroes' way of making music, which is crucial to jazz? To answer that, Bob, I'd have to go into the nature of jazz, and I don't know that there's that much interest around for anything that deep. Oh, well, anyway, Alex, she asked what jazz is, and we've been talking about everything else. So why don't you tell me? Sure, thing. Suppose I make a comparison between joy and suffering in Negro life and jazz as music. All of you have seen various aspects of Negro life at times, right? Take, for instance, the area right around where we had our jam session yesterday as a starter. Let's look at some of these manifestations of Negro life and compare them to jazz, okay? As Lewis put it a moment ago, a Negro is potentially capable of experiencing everything that all Americans experience, plus Negroes undergo the hazard of being Negro. The hazard of being Negro begins before birth and extends beyond death. The difficulty in being Negro resides in being able to accept all the hazards of being Negro and simultaneously to triumph over these hazards. Jazz is the musical expression of the triumph of the Negro spirit. joy and suffering in jazz is based on a contradiction in jazz. This contradiction is between freedom and restraint. Let's start with restraint in jazz. The feeling of restraint in jazz is caused in part by the way jazz form operates. The basic formal unit of jazz, which is called the chorus, repeats itself endlessly without getting anywhere. That is why the chorus is restraining 
This endless repetition is like a chain around the spirit and is a reflection of the denial of a future to the Negro in the American way of life. Restraining factor in jazz are the changes. Like any other structure, the chorus is held together by certain materials and their patterns. These materials and their patterns are termed harmonies. The jazz man calls them changes. The changes are stated through the rhythm section, especially the piano and guitar. The pattern of the changes is repeated over and over again. <laughs> restraining because of their endless repetition, in much the same way that the Negro experiences the endless daily humiliation of American life, which bequeaths him a futureless future. In conflict with America's gift of a futureless future is the Negro's image of himself. Through glorifying the inherent joy and freedom in each present moment of life, the Negro transforms America's image of him into a transport of joy. Denied a future, the joyous celebration of the present is the Negro's answer to America's ceaseless attempts to obliterate him. Jazz is a musical expression of the Negro's eternal recreation of the present. The Negro's spring worship of the present in jazz occurs through the constant creation of new ideas in jazz. These new ideas are born by improvising through the restraints of the form and the changes. Jazz reflects the improvised life thrust upon the Negro. Now, melody is one element which can be used in improvisation. The soloist creates his melody through elaborating on various details of the changes. The manner in which each change shall be elaborated upon is a problem of the eternal present as Negro life admits of many individual solutions, so does the way in which a change can be elaborated upon. Of course, the Negro, as man and or jazz man, must be constantly creative, for that is how he remains free. Otherwise, the dehumanizing portrait America has drawn of him will triumph. <laughs> Thank you. 
Negro, each present moment must be electric, full of meaning and seething with life. This is made manifest in gesture, in walk, and in dance. Now rhythm electrifies each present moment in jazz. This electrification is born of the conflict of two types of rhythm which exist simultaneously in nearly every bar of jazz. Some call this electrification caused by jazz rhythm swinging, and it is through swinging that an additional feeling of freedom enters. The emphasis on a conflict of kinds of rhythm, namely a rhythm of stress and one of length, is characteristic of Negro music all over the world. And through utilizing this emphasis, the American Negro produces an oblique musical product and a damaging commentary on the human wastelands of America. Through melodic improvisation and the ever-present contradiction in rhythm, the Negro makes an art form that insists on the deification of the present and which, among other things, is an unconscious holding action until he is also master of his future. Melodic improvisation and rhythmic conflict are the joyful, freeing, and present-oriented aspects of jazz, while form and the changes are the suffering, restraining, and futureless aspects of jazz. Negro life, in addition to its struggle to become, also has its characteristic atmosphere, color, and sensuality. In jazz, this is reflected by the sonority of the music. The jazz man substitutes the word sound for sonority. Think of the sound of much Negro music compared to Negro life. sound of jazz as performed by whites compared to white life. contradiction between worship of the present, freedom and joy, and the realization of the futureless future, restraint and suffering, which the American way of life has bestowed upon the Negro. The cry of joy and suffering in jazz is then based on the ever-present contradiction between freedom and restraint. The feeling of freedom is based on the Negro's view of what life in America should be, while the feeling of restraint is based on the actual inhuman situation in which the Negro finds himself. I think that 
boils down to you what jazz is. It sure does. Mm -hmm. Alex, you said something before about a special slant the Negro has on the American scene. Now, I don't see why Negroes see things differently than anybody else. John. Oh, look! Negroes are just like everybody else. Oh, no, they're not. You see, the Negro looks at the human arena in America indirectly. He views America with a special clarity and penetration. He can do this because he's grown up in a corner and made the most of it. So he suffered. But why put him in a corner? I didn't put him there. Don't you know who put him there? He's there because of the outrageous savagery of you white Americans. You act as if we're not human. Are you human? <laughs> the Negro is the only human American. I am too human. I've got eyes, hair, nose, and a face just like you. It takes more than a face, a nose, or hair to be human. It takes a soul. Oh, Alex, you know we've got souls. If Americans had souls, they wouldn't have tried to take ours away from us. And they're still trying to take them away. Take away your souls? How? You wiped out our past. We have no yesterday to look back on. With slavery, you wiped out our today, and the present day savagery is intended to deprive us of our tomorrow. If America had her way, time would vanish for the Negro. Well, then how does the Negro survive? Through spirituals, through the blues, then through jazz. We made a memory of our past and a promise of all to come. Then the history of jazz is the story of the fantastic ingenuity of the Negro in America. Yes, that's the part of the incredible genius of the Negro. Well, come on over here and tell us about the history of jazz. Well, I imagine that all of you remember to some extent the music which was played at our concert yesterday. We'll use that music as basis for a discussion. Now, Faye, the jazz from which the other major styles developed was New Orleans jazz. New Orleans jazz was the first jazz style as distinguished from blues and spirituals, those other monuments to the history of the struggle of the Negro spirit. Yesterday, we didn't hear any New Orleans jazz, but we did hear Dixieland, which is derivative from New Orleans jazz. New Orleans jazz was, among other things, the Negro's present moment, all he had, and this all he made completely his own. Characteristic of this music are highly flowery melodies conducting intensely competitive conversations against each other simultaneously. The beats of the rhythm section are essentially alike. Years later, after many Negroes had left the inhuman South and migrated to the more cleverly inhuman North, their problem, among others, was how to retain their identity through the restraints of city living, mechanized and brutalizing jobs, and fragmented families. The musical answer came in the form of swing, in which you have a highly arranged, precise music with only a few key men using their individuality to improvise. Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, and Theolonius Monk introduced bebop. Emphasis focused on long, snake-like melodies, small instrumental combinations, and changes or harmonies derived from Debussy and Ravel. Cymbals emphasized the second and fourth beats, thus freeing the rest of the drums for commentative playing. 
Bebop also, among other things, was a revolt against the subservient Uncle Tom role given Negroes in the war effort and the entertainment world of that era. thin, soft sounds, and a highly arranged music using many devices from serious music of past days. The soloists based their styles to a great extent on stars of the Count Basie band of the swing era, especially Lester Perez Young. Cool jazz has been called by some an attempt to remove the Negro influence from jazz, because jazz is the one element in American life where whites must be humble to Negroes. Chicago. The Sun Ra, among other things, fuses the snake-like bebop melodies with colors of Duke Ellington and the experimental changes of Theolonius Monk. The Sun Ra says of his music that it is a portrayal of everything the Negro really was, is, and is going to be, with emphasis focused on the Negro's triumph over the demonic currents of his experience. <laughs> I'm interested in what's going to happen to jazz. John, aren't you? Yes, but... Alex, I've been thinking about something you said before. What's that, John? Well, look. Granted that the Negro is the fountainhead of jazz, isn't it possible that a white can be just as basic to jazz as a Negro? That's a fair question. Yes, it could be possible. But possible only when the whites have paid the price in suffering to be the Negro's equal. But we are your equal. What are you talking about? But you're not our equals in suffering. People just don't go out searching for suffering. How will we ever be your equals? Well, the first step will be to accept the Negro's tragic experience of reverence and humbleness. But we're individuals. We've got our own way to go. And that way is leading America nowhere but to death and doom. But the Negro's way of looking at life is offering hope to everybody. Certainly. Jazz is telling everybody's story. Why can't you accept it? Oh, wait a minute. That's outrageous. Outrageous, my eye. This joy and suffering in jazz has cut across many differences in people and has won many friends for us overseas. They really go wild over it in Europe, Asia, and South America. Do they? Do they now? I don't know about that. Then you must be pretty dumb. You know, it seems to me that jazz and the Negro could win friends for this country more readily than the other things we're doing in the Cold War. Now, how can you be so illogical, Faye? Foreign policy is one thing, jazz is another. But she's right, because people in foreign countries sense the warmth and beauty in American Negroes and jazz, while they distrust white Americans. I don't see it. But anyway, Faye said something earlier about being interested in what's going to happen to jazz. Would you tell me, Alex? Yes, jazz is dead. <laughs> well, if jazz is dead, then the Negro's dead, right? No, wrong. What do you mean, jazz is dead? Why, jazz is selling more records today than ever before. Why is jazz dead, Alex? Jazz is dead because the Negro needs more room to tell his story. But isn't jazz enough? Well, it should be, the way you guys have been talking about it. You know, there are limits. His story deserves more than just jazz, jazz, jazz. Jazz for all its power, beauty, and world dominance is too limiting. 
It's a genteel slavery. Slavery was over in 1863. Why must you guys always keep crying the blues? Look, I'm sick and tired of hearing Negroes accused of crying the blues. This is nutty, absolutely and positively nutty. I've given in to you on those other points, Alex, but not on this one. Why not? Oh, come on, let's cool down, okay? Now, if the Negro won't need jazz, who will need it? American whites will need it in order to understand the suffering which is needed in order to try to become human. Well, in what way is jazz dead, though, Alex? Let me clarify. The jazz body is dead, but the spirit of jazz is alive. But why is the body dead? The body is dead because inherently the material of jazz does not allow for further growth. But what are these inherent reasons for the death of the jazz body? The inherent reasons for the death of jazz center around the restraining elements of jazz. The restraining elements of jazz are the form and the changes. If any attempts are made to develop the form and or the changes, the swing or the spirit of jazz is lost. Since the jazz body cannot grow, it can only repeat itself. In so doing, it is stagnant. In so doing, it is dead. The three reasons for the death of the jazz body are, one, the changes cannot evolve and retain the form, two, the form cannot evolve and retain the swing, and three, both the changes and the form cannot evolve simultaneously and have jazz. In all three alternatives, we have no growth in jazz, and that is what I mean by the death of the jazz body. Jazz cannot grow because it was not meant to grow. Its dead body stands as a monument to the Negro, who was supposed to die in the American scheme of things. Any attempts to develop the form or changes of jazz gives us only a circular seesaw, a circular seesaw which leads America or the Negro nowhere. In a way, the strangling image of a futureless future has made the Negro a dead thing, too. The Negro can only become alive by the construction of America's future. controls America's destiny. What do you mean our destiny? He can't control America's destiny. But he can. You see, the Negro is their conscience if they have a conscience. And if they don't, they're less than human. What? What's happening here? What's this? A Mau Mau meeting? I thought this was a jazz club. This is nothing but black chauvinism. It's this black Americanism. Shut up when I think of the terrible burden the Negro has in trying to teach American whites how to become human. After all, we're not boasting, we're merely laying down the facts. And you may as well accept them or disappear like a handful of smoke. Alex, I don't think 
think what you're saying is black chauvinism. And I think any American white thinks he can judge the Negro that readily is just being awfully arrogant. Look, Alex, I don't know what to call this, but I wouldn't call it black chauvinism. Forget it. Like most American whites, she is to be pitied. Pitied? America's soul is an empty void. The most Americans can see in tomorrow's mirror is a Cadillac or deep freeze. Yes, or a man walking in outer space. Oh, my God. What's this got to do with jazz or the Negro, Alex? Simply this. America needs an immediate sense of values. It's borrowing from the Negro in language and dress and rock and roll and in jazz in order to fill this need. I don't think we're really wise enough to look to the Negro yet. Have we really looked at all, Alex? Not officially, not consciously, but with creeping reluctance, shame, and pathetic curiosity, America's beginning to look to the Negro for the answers to our problems. But what is the meaning of the death of jazz? The death of jazz is the first faint cry of the salvation of the Negro through the birth of a new way of life. Right, Alex. The salvation of the Negro and the rest of America. That is, if America can realize that the hope for America lies through the American Negro. Then America needs the Negro to teach us how to be American, right? And John, Faye, Natalie, and Bruce, where else does America's future image as a world power reside but in the dark soul of the Negro, whose salvation has now become in the world's watching eyes the vindication of America's posture? This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.